As a small company, what we're doing, or any company, we're teaching you how to think. We are in a thinking person's business. And most people do not want to think because thinking takes work. It's hard. But if you want to win, the most committed win, I always caveat that, the most committed who are eth ethically win, the most committed ethically win, because you could be an unethical person and do unethical things to try to win, right? So um, never compromise your ethics. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, first and last name. My name is uh, Peter Learney, and I am the founder of Solutionary. Okay. And as right before we got started today, you were telling me about what's happening in the marketplace, and, and you said it's a generational time we're in. Yeah, it's sort of interesting, and I think it impacts companies of all sizes. Um, I always say that the smartest people that I've known are in their late 60s and 70s, and they're leaving and they're gone. And uh, what's happened in our industry and in the government itself, from sort of mirror images, is that there's this big bathtub effect in the middle where a lot of the, um, the institutional knowledge, the um, implicit knowledge of, of learning how to do your job well uh, was never transferred down properly. And so you're starting to see an erosion of doing the fundamentals not well, for example. Um, you see them in uh, contract shops where you have sloppy um, solicitations put out. And now it really is a human capital. Root causes a human capital issue. You see, um, so you see risk embedded into acquisitions from the get-go. You see um, young uh, individuals uh, put into, or even people who've left the government or military come on the contractor side, who are going into the business development area, whether it be business development or capture, okay or even proposal management and a lot of things that were common knowledge or fundamental despite all the great resources that are available to us um just don't know those fundamentals so just like in baseball when you don't do well it's always issue of not um mastering the fundamentals well so i think that's in play in our industry in govcon um the contractor and the government side one of the things that you were saying is, uh, when do you think this this began? Well I, well, I think it started back in the 90s when they reinvented government. I think events like September 11th uh, put our focus not on reconstituting what we knew as human capital gap as, uh, as in the early 2000s, and we've really never addressed it. And then obviously we've had some accelerants that have decimated human capital, um, particularly on the government side and on um, the more experienced side of the contractor side, and that was um, the pandemic. So I think um, a lot of things that were really uh, common knowledge um, in um, government acquisition, in responding to acquisitions in the contractor side, very fundamental things are lost, have been lost rather. And all the more important for us, associations and even organizations such as yours uh, to help uh, industry. And companies of all size could benefit from that. Wow. So tell us, Peter, uh, tell us about your background and um, what brings you like to have a, a vested interest in the marketplace, federal marketplace. Fair enough. So um, many years ago, when I exited the Navy, I uh, moved to the National Capital Region. And I started working uh, as a consultant uh, for KPMG Consultant back then, and as well as um, a small, after that, a small company, which when I joined, it was only a few million dollars. Uh, many, many years later, we were acquired for a large sum of money at $236 a share. And in that firm, um, I did delivery for many years, but we all did, we all helped out with capture. We all helped out with proposals. We all helped out with improving the corporate capabilities of the company. For example, trying to get the company a CMMI level certification, and we all helped with recruiting and things of that nature. But I, I sort of had a uh, gravitated towards capture, and uh, we're all products of the way we think. We all have, we all use mental models to uh, reflect how we do things. I'm a systems thinker, and when I was with my clients for many years, I was always doing analysis. I was always assessing large weapons programs and doing analysis. And when it came time for me to do capture, I just started doing a lot of the upfront analysis that a lot of people do not do. 
And I started federating these analyses naturally together in a certain way. And they resulted in win after win after win. And at some point um, in our lives, we're all encouraged by someone to do what we're doing today. I think encourage, encouragement is important. And my former founder pulled me aside and he said, whatever's in your head, why don't you put it down? Because it's working. And I put it down. And when I met with him again, he says, you know, Peter, you closed a gap in a market. Because the market does not show us how to think. And that's what I what I, what I always uh, emphasize because um, it was always drilled into me is that GovCon is a thinking person's business. Anybody can write a proposal and produce an output, but to get an outcome, a uh, competitive win, particularly for a high dollar value uh, solution based prime contract, mission critical prime contract in particular, um, you have to think. And so, just like in anything, if you want to take shortcuts, then you're going to just uh, kill a tree and submit a bid, or you're going to produce an output, not going to win. So what I did was um, I was encouraged to um, start teaching this way of thinking. And about eight years ago, I built a body of knowledge around it. And I teach a, a course around it called Solution Engineering. And it's based upon a frame this framework that I had developed called the Solution Engineering Framework. When I um, was asked by someone who uh, ran a large uh, global company, public sector, uh, to teach their uh, sales executives and their capture managers this framework and over a few, few year period applying this framework resulted in eight competitive wins in three countries almost 900 million dollars and that was with state local and overseas so i got encouraged again because um then uh, my founder pulled me aside he says peter why don't you turn it into a book so i published a book on it called solution engineering and then around 2019, early 2019, he pulled me aside again. He says, Peter, why don't you turn what you've done into a software? Because you're the product. And so I, I got my uh, one one of my, my business partner, my one business partner, and, and our team is a small team of five individuals. Uh, myself, a lead architect, a uh, data science, um, an AI scientist, and uh, business engagement lead and a compliance um, lead. And um, we started working to turn it into a, a software. And so uh, the, the pandemic for us was sort of like an opportunity. Uh, things sort of slowed down. And we, um, we, we turned what I do today into a software such that um, when I consult with clients, um, I use the software. And now when they see how I use the software, they're starting to license the software. So I, my company, Solutioneering, has um, primarily three offerings. We teach a course called the Solution Engineering Framework. We do consulting, left seat, right seat, to companies of all sizes. And we uh, license a software, which we call Solution Engineering Tool, or SET for short, which we, we we've, uh, are starting to offer in three separate offerings. So now let's talk about what is solution engineering. Uh, I know that you said that teach people how to think and uh, you and I, right, we were together um, recently in San Diego and I had, I spent some more time with you, but for people out there listening that doesn't quite know what does solution engineering mean, right? What does that mean? Sure. Well, I always like to tell people that uh, the government does not buy technology. It buys benefits realization, ideally quantifiable benefits, and it doesn't want risk, so it wants risk mitigation. And when we think about a solution, it's an integrative set of things. It's the companies you picked to be on as teaming partners. It's your past performance. It's your leadership team, i.e. key people I putting forth. It's your technical approach that'll give birth to your, a technical solution, if that's the case. It's your management approach. It's the frameworks, methods, and tools, and techniques, et cetera, that enable those approaches. It's your staffing solution and your pricing, price to win your pricing strategy, and the basis of estimate. That's the solution. It's an integrated set of things. And um, what we focus on in solution, solutioneering as a company is the upfront thinking in advance of the writing before you put pen to paper to answer that most important question in a competitive pursuit, why your company? 
and to that that integrated solution set, as I like to call it, that I describe, it's supposed to produce many strengths and many weaknesses, many strengths and weaknesses, because um, those those get identified, but and so you could potentially turn them into strengths. But it starts to build for you an inventory of strengths. Because if you don't have the strengths, the balance of the writing, what are you writing to? Because the government does not read your proposal, it scores it. And if those, poor, those strengths don't pop out in seven to 10 seconds, they're off the page. So, but you can't get those strengths and you can't get the other strategies unless you do the upfront analyses. So the solution engineering framework is a way of thinking. It's not a process, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of doing business, as my one partner likes to say. So. Uh, we do opportunity assessment a certain way, and that involves uh, different types of analyses. Uh, are you putting the right items in your pipeline? How, what's the state of the opportunity as you're doing BD on? What's the, how well do you understand the opportunity? And we do an assessment called Opportunity Context Index, which would support a bid, no bid decision. It's not PWIN, but you can look at it as a neighbor of PWIN. And those are precursor analyses that we do. Uh, we do analysis called issue key factor analysis. Go so what? You, Say it again. Called issue key factor analysis. Okay. So you you identify the issues and why they're issues and to whom they're issues and the customer psychographics, like maybe their uh, their uh, kind of person they are. Are they an egotist, a visionary, right? Their decision making authority. Um, are they an evaluation panel or not? What's the relationship towards your company? And we identify those issues in the top. We might identify twenty, but we look for the top four to seven. We do a key factor analysis and we try to understand what has to be brought to the table to address those issues that are driving procurement, those top four to seven, and why they're important to the customer. And we align them with the issues in a many, many relationship. And again, we look for customer psychographics because if you if you don't have the issues and key factors, if you don't know them, which are driving the requirements, and ideally if you haven't tested them with the customer, you shouldn't be bidding the opportunity. That's like, like building a house on sand. So then if you do that type of analysis, you should, you should have an understanding of what the ideal winner looks like, the notional winner. And the ideal doesn't exist, even if you're an incumbent, but you want to use that as a benchmark. And that's the kind of context that you bring into doing a competitive assessment. And I always tell people that um, most people say, yeah, we did a competitive assessment, we did a SWOT analysis. Well, that's essential, but it's not sufficient. And there's a reason why. Because when we do um, a competitive assessment, and we're really trying to figure out um, why us or why not us or why a competitor, why not a competitor. And part of that is when you're doing um, a technique like a SWOT analysis, you're trying to identify your strengths and weaknesses for yourself and your competitors. So you can highlight your strengths eventually and minimize your weaknesses or neutralize the other guy's strengths or exploit your weaknesses or more. But when we do a SWOT analysis, we're just using a certain mental model in our dialogue, in our interaction with each other. And... Um, so therefore, I always recommend, hey, do a bitter comparison um, where you make an apples to apples comparison. Maybe their, their modules of their technology compared to your modules or how they might respond to a part of the SOW compared to you. Let's do that apples to apples comparison because now you have a different type of dialogue and you're identifying strengths and weaknesses that you might not have identified if you just did a SWOT analysis. So when you're doing these analyses, you're starting to uh, uh, extract out proposal strategy inputs. So what we also do a uh, fortified forces analysis and a black hat review. So you could do one sum of all those analyses as to support your competitive assessment. The more you do it, the better off you will be because you are helping build that uh, your, strat- your inventory strategies that you're going to use to annotate an outline in a competitive response and particularly build an inventory strengths. When people often uh, say we have a, uh, a differentiator, or a discriminator, and they don't mean the same thing, a dif- discriminator being something of greater magnitude, I say, how did how'd you get to it? And they often say, well, we're unique because, well, that's essential, but it's not sufficient. Because a discriminator really means the other guy can't make the same claim. You know how it helps the government, who it helps and why it's important to them. You know the benefit to get, ideally quantifiable, quantified benefit or the risk it mitigates, and you can substantiate a proof point and all those things have to be true. It's an end statement to have a, um, a qualified discriminator. So if I know my discriminator and I got my gaps into the gap analysis, I could formulate that win strategy. And that win strategy essentially is 
those seven or eight high level statements on how I'm going to win that factor in my company's offering and the circumstances of our company. And so what we're doing so far, just to get to that win strategy, we've done these analyses that so we have a traceable, defensible, explainable way to justify it. Very often in my experience, I see business developers and capture managers at um, BDU meetings and they'll say, oh, this is the win strategy. And you say, how'd you get there? And they'll really song and dance and they'll, they'll give a good story. But once you say to them, show me how you got there, they can't show you. They can't show you the homework they did to get to that win strategy. Just like when your kids are doing their math and they say the answer is 64 and you say, how'd you get to it? So unless they materially put the analysis down, it doesn't exist because if it doesn't materially exist, you can't give it to the, your customers downstream. When I did capture, my customers that proposal team, my customers that solution architect, my customers at C-suite and everybody else in the company. So a good caption manager takes care of those internal customers first and foremost. But I could go on, but I'll stop right there because there's more to the framework, but I'll stop right there. All right. Uh, one of the couple of things, you said discriminator and differentiator are not the same, right? The discriminator, you said it's something of greater magnitude or another guy cannot make the same claim. So yeah. how would you describe differentiator? Okay, so you and I might be different. Okay, let's, um, let's say, for example, in the case of a, a program manager, Okay. I say the government says, we want a program manager with uh, 10 years experience who's worked in a program of similar size, scope, and complexity. And they have to have, in the case of its DOD, like a DIWIA certification, which is analogous to near the program management, which is sort of like a PMP, if you think about it, the government's in the, uh, like a PMP in a civilian side. And, and they say, okay, well, um, Eric... He has uh, acquired years of experience, worked on a program of similar size, scope and complexity, and, and so did Peter. Okay. And, but uh, Eric did it in for the Navy and Peter did it for the Air Force. Right. So we're, we're different here. Okay. But let's say that uh, this is a, a program that deals with Navy supply systems and you happen to be a Navy retired Navy supply officer. Oh, and you happen to be a user of that system. And you happen to also be involved in the original instance of that system when it was designed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now when they're putting, we're, we're different, right? We're both PMs, you're Air, I'm, I'm Air Force, you're Navy, um, similar type of supply uh, or supply systems. However, this is now a Navy system. And when they put you forth, and, and you happen to know the personalities, the politics, and the protocols of the people in uh, NAFSUP, and they know you. So therefore, when um, what's being offered? Well, um, Eric's being offered with uh, 30 years of Navy supply experience, right? Of which uh, 15 were as a program manager, right? That's what they're being given. And there's a quantification in that, right? How does it help them? Well, it helps them manage this program in a risk-reduced manner, right? But why is your experience important to them? Because unlike me, you know the personalities of pro the politics and the protocols of the people in the government. So you could therefore have navigated more risk-reduced transition, right? And that maybe that was an important thing to them. That's why it's important to them. Mm. And that's discriminating. I can't make that claim. Right. Right. right? So you have to think. So whenever somebody says on a competitive pursuit, you're talking about tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, people just can't say things. They have to show how they got to it. Otherwise, it might look good in a PowerPoint slide, but there's, if there's nothing behind that slide, you're setting, you're setting uh, the company up for competitive loss. I like that. Okay. Uh, that makes sense. Um, tell me... I know, and again, we've had this conversation before. So how does, so we know we're talking about the bigger companies, but how does the small businesses, how does this help them, right? The smaller guys. It helps in a lot of ways because if you're, if you're a small company, okay, what I teach and particularly in our software, there's a lot of capability. But when you're a sub, okay, um, a large company is looking at you and you, they might have like other small companies 
on the team. And that large prime will bring you only on the team. And it, they shouldn't bring a company only on the team because it checks off some kind of socioeconomic requirement, right. service disabled or whatever the case may be. They should bring you on the team because you're closing a capability gap um, that they have. Or you bring customer, you know, customer contacts, the mission or people to the table. Or you have some type of credibility just in the area. So that's the first thing. So what the framework does is it helps you really qualify your value proposition to that time in a traceable, defensible, expendable manner. So you can clearly articulate why us? Why should you bring them on the team? Why should we be brought on the team? What are we doing for you? That's the first thing it can do. Second thing is that prime will judge you on the goodness of your proposal inputs responsiveness of those inputs and the goodness of those inputs. So if they say, you know, um, Eric, you are going to be responsible for writing uh, section uh, 3, one through 3.6, dealing with test and evaluation. Okay. So a lot of small companies, they just throw writing. They could throw the kitchen sink they, or they could throw nothing at the table. And, and right away, they're judging you on the goodness of how you're going to support them in the execution of a contract. Because if you're a small company and you're giving them quality input, and the key to that quality input, it's a function of the quality of the thinking that went into the input. Okay, so we have capabilities that allow small companies, okay, to um, quickly assess whether they should bid or no bid. Um, whether something should be in their pipeline and whether they should bid or no bid. Not a P-Win calculator. That's one way. The other thing that we do is we give them shortcut on how to produce quality input in terms of writing, or I, as I like to say, thinking, to that prime. Okay? So that prime can turn their writing easily into a red team proof narrative. And those are just some of the ways. A company, um, what we've done in our software is uh, we are embedding into, because different companies have different levels of maturity. So if you think of um, the CMMI levels of maturity, it's analogous to that, but not exact. And so if a company is just starting out in GovCon, and we know that they're immature, the software prescribes what they choose in the software in terms of what they'll get most benefit from at their level of maturity. And when you do, if you use the framework in a manual sense, you get the benefits I described. But if you use a, what I call software automation of what we, we have, whether you win or lose a competitive bid, the value of your company is always going up, always going up. And I'm going to describe that later on in a little bit more detail. Uh, I mean, I think I think you probably want to describe it now, just because. I mean, okay. that's I, that's hard for someone to understand that if you win or the value of your company continues to go up. Okay, so um, when we turn our, our the framework into a software, okay, our software is different. It closes a gap in the market. We like to say the thinking gap. And if you think of all the business development tools in the BD tool ecosystem of the business development lifecycle. There's business intelligence tools, and those are essential. There's CRMs, and those are essential. There's natural natural language parsers that thread a uh, shred solicitations, you know, produce compliant outlines and things like that. Those are essential. And there's proposal workflow tools; those are essential. But we actually are a new type of tool in that ecosystem. And and to keep it simple, we fit between to the right of a of a CRM, a customer relationship management system and to the left of a proposal workflow tool. Well, our tool is meant to be used collaboratively. Okay, it's meant to where you bring information in the form of your customer, your company, your competition, and you collaboratively do the analyses. It's a SaaS, so it could be, or it could be on-premise. And, um, and as you're doing these analyses, at time zero, we're always producing a data lake of authentic intelligence, not artificial intelligence, because at time zero, all of our data is tagged and all the data in our data lake is analyzed. 
So we're building a data lake of authentic intelligence. The second thing we're doing is every time it's used by, by SMEs, for example, we are capturing intellectual capital of everybody who's using it, right? So we're capturing it. So if you take, um, you know, I always say, re, you know, proposal reuse libraries is a, is a door to disaster because most pro being a proposal person is a thankless job. Very often because people do not do their work up front, then all the, you know what, falls on their lap, mm -hmm. right? And they become, sadly, output driven versus outcome. The measure of effectiveness is, is it on time? Is it compliant? That's essential to win, but it's not sufficient. Right. Okay. It's not sufficient. Okay. So if I said to you, hey, Eric, here's the winning proposal, right? Well, you can't reuse that proposal. You can't reuse that content. There's a reason why. You don't know the strategies that you don't know the strategies and things that were reflected in it that got you to the win. But right. what we do in a biblical sense, when you're doing every time you're using set and you're building this data lake of um, of strategies and more, it's the original Greek. We, we're producing digital threads of information that are from the issues to the key factors to um, the analysis that produced them to the strategies to the strength to the uh, to the strengths to the evaluation factors that score the points, the, that are points awarded against, rather. And we're producing digital threads of information, of authentic intelligence that you know where that where that data was produced, what's the, the source of truth of it, its pedigree, right, source of origin. And really, sometimes when you look at a lot of AI systems today, what they're doing is they're trying to um, search untagged data. And they're trying to do it on the back end. We're doing it on the back and the front end as we've operate, operate, operationalized our software and its use. And going back to the um, answer to that question about whether you win or lose, why is the value of the company always going up? Because you're always capturing intellectual capital of people in its original form before it was put into the proposal and contaminated. Mm. Right? Uh, okay. Like you said, you can, showing your work. And showing your work. And so right. we build a visual blueprint of the win. Uh, we, we have the digital threads of, of, of information. We have all that we have the uh, intellectual cap capital we've captured. For me, um, besides winning a competitive pursuit, what most excited me as a capture manager is when I was able to go to that proposal manager and show him or her all the inf all the stuff that I produced as a result of my capture efforts with my team that we produced rather this winning's a team sport that I was giving to giving to that person that proposal manager and their their team to be successful. Okay, there, there are no shortcuts in life. If you want to win, you got to do the work. So even though I say we're using a technology, we're using a, a technology to federate our efforts to integrate our efforts. But we still have to do the work. Gotcha. No technology is going to make you win a competitive pursuit alone. So uh, let me ask this question, right? We've talked a lot about the software. What are some of the challenges that people are having today with this? Let's 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 negate the fact that there's this um, lack of people understanding GovCon and Capture and BD, but what are some of the challenges that you see that people are faced with, even those who understand Capture and BD and what that means, what are some of the challenges that they're faced with? Well, a lot of people know how to play Capture Management, but a lot of people don't know how to do Capture Management. And what I mean by that is, if you look at um, like LinkedIn, and you get if you get these the lifespan of a typical capture manager in most companies is used to be like maybe two years ago, two years, this is years ago. Then it went down to like a year and a half and a year, sometimes it's like nine months. And you're saying, why is that? Well, th there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one has to be in a lot of ways, companies are trying to buy Rolodex, but those Rolodexes are limited because 
the government people aren't in, in the buildings as much as they used to be, so you can't walk the halls of the agency. And their, their Rolodex gets stale. So that's one part, right? Uh, second, I like that. I like that. Right? Now, the second part is, the second part is, and the point I'm getting at is, is that um, they're really good at the administrate administrivia of a capture. They know everything about a vehicle, right? They know every, you know, they know the names and the organization. You know, they, they know what's going to happen on it. You know, they can tell you about the industry day or this or that. But if you ask them to facilitate the types of analyses that I described, most cannot. And unless you unless you could do those types of analyses, and I'm not I'm not talking about putting something up on a PowerPoint slide so you could get to a through a BD meeting for the next two weeks, and then I got by for two weeks, you collected a paycheck for two weeks, and then two weeks after that. I'm saying, did you do your homework? Can you show me how you got to that win strategy? Show me materially the analyses that you did. Because if you cannot, then you're not taking care of the internal customers, right? You're you're giving the C-suite a false sense of confidence. You are not preparing the solution architect to reflect um, the right kind of strategies in their, their solutioning in terms of strengths they have to emphasize or weaknesses they have to mitigate or potentially competitive strengths they have to exploit or, or weaknesses they have to neutralize or strengths they have to neutralize. You are not um, setting up that proposal manager by giving um, them the strategies that they can allocate against requirements of an outline to be reflected in, in, in the solicitation. Oh, this is where we're going to highlight this, this strength and this is where we're going to try to minimize this weaknesses and this is how we're going to do it. So it's like, and I'm writing an article about this right now. It should be out this week or next. And um, it's really saying that just like if a, if a house doesn't have a good architecture, it's going to collapse, right? Well, just like a capture, if a capture, a com competitive, a competitive pursuit doesn't have a good app architecture, and it's not the win strategy. Win strategy is part of it. The architecture is what got you to the win strategy. The win strategy is those seven or eight high-level statements, but the architecture is how did you get to it? That's part of it. And then the other part of the architecture is, you know, how all the things that you're doing to substantiate, substantiate it. But what we teach in our, our course is we teach small companies and, and mid companies and large companies. I just taught a large Native American company, about 40 of their people, um, the framework. We teach them this way of thinking. And then typically what they ask us to do is they say, hey, can you, now you've taught, and I, I heard this from somebody one time, and I think it's a true statement because this person's a lot more experienced than me and I respect them a lot. And they says, you know, if you train 20 people, 10 people weren't even paying attention. Right. Five people will sort of get it, but five will be disciples. So now typically once we do that, we train them, they usually ask us, hey, with this capture manager, can you go ahead and facilitate a deal with them where they're bringing context to the table and you're facilitating them right seat, right, left seat, like teaching a kid to drive? And it's more like, again, training the trainer. Now you're showing them, really doing a real one. And then once they see what you're doing, they typically, because we use the software when we do it now, they say, hey, you know, we we can actually do that on our own. We can scale. Exactly. And um, then they start, license, start to license the software. But I think the hardest part for companies is that they think that if I throw enough bids against the wall, I'm going to win something. Well, that's dangerous because a couple of things. If you look at our business, you know, our country's big and its challenges are pretty complex. And it's going to industry, companies of all sizes to help. So when you when you when you when you're a contractor and you're del providing delivery, you should look at it as a privilege, not a right. Just as if you wore the uniform in your military, that you have a mission to help, right? Oh yeah, I agree with that. And so, if you're if you if you're trying to if you are if that if you're sloppy and that one thing did stick, you might have won, but you didn't do the necessary upfront thinking. You got lucky, and what you did was you embedded risk into your execution, right? So therefore, with the customers expecting the government customer, you're not going to meet their cost schedule performance thresholds. 
Well, if you start mm. that becomes aggregated across an agency, the agency can't perform its mission. If it goes across a, a country, the country's going to have challenges, right? So first as contractors, we have to think that way. We have to, we have to look at our work with a higher purpose. But as a small company, what we're doing, or any company, we're teaching you how to think. We are in a thinking person's business. And that's and, and and most people do not want to think because thinking takes work. It's hard. But if you want to win, the most committed win, I always caveat that, the most committed who are eth- ethically win, the most committed ethically win, because you could be an unethical person and do unethical things to try to win, right? So um, never compromise your ethics. A couple things. Um, we've, we've, I mean, we've gone over a lot of information uh, in a short period of time. And... Um, I want to go back. Um, I've taken a lot of notes, by the way, just so you know. Um, That's fair. <laughs> I'm just trying to, I want to keep people that are listening to this on, on point. So, and I'm trying to remember what, what I know about versus what we've shared today. So uh, one of the things that you mentioned when we talked about that your software works along with other solutions, such as CRMs and media intelligence proposed workflow tools. Can you just, again, we're not advocating for anybody, but Right, people people are gonna ask like very questions like, does it work with Dell Tech, right, or GovWin, stuff like yeah. that. Do I need GovWin if I have your tool? Does it, I mean, what does GovWin do for me, and and versus like what your tool would do for me? How's that? That's fair. Would I say uh, I describe all those tools are essential. All those tools have different purposes, and they a number of them come from very good vendors. And actually, some of those vendors who I met, they have really good cultures and they're good people. And um, we don't have a logical connection to those softwares, okay, in terms of uh, of an interface. We can interface if asked, okay? We are a new type of tool in that ecosystem. So we're not competing with them because we're, in, we're something new or innovative. And so if you have... Um, say GovWin IQ, okay, which provides an essential service where it's essentially uh, federating. I mean, think about how much time it would take you if you had to go out there and look for that type of information on your own, right? But that's the beginning of the journey. It's an important part of the journey, but it's the beginning part of the journey. Now, if you can buy the same information from GovWin IQ, and I can buy the same information. Who has to come have advantage? Neither of us does. Right. Same. And you might be smarter than me, and you might ask their analysts certain types of questions, and they will, um, like they do, they will package the information for you, and they'll give it to you. But if I could ask the same question, who has a competitive advantage? The competitive advantage comes into play is when you get the people in your company together, and you get information of your company, customer, and the competition, and you do the most important thing in winning a competitive pursuit, you dialogue. And what we're doing is we're, produ- we're providing an environment where a, uh, a set of integrated tools, okay, to allow you to do different types of analyses collaboratively, and such that when you're doing these analyses, a lot of things are happening. You're producing a starting to build a visual blueprint of the win, you can generate artifacts of that analysis, right? The data, every time you put you do the analysis, the data in the software, resulting data moves to support a subsequent analysis. So for example, if I did a hot button issue analysis, that data would be moving over to the key factor analysis to support that analysis. Or the issue analysis data might move over to the competitive assessment uh, air, um, Components we like to say so that when we are doing a say a black hat review, that data is already there because t- what does typically happens now? It's on somebody's Excel spreadsheet. It's in a PowerPoint slide. It's in a different part of a server. It's it's all over the place. But here it's all federated collaboratively. So we are to the right. Um, we we would look at data coming from any type of CRM as an input, and. But the data from the CRM, most data in CRM, most BD people don't like to put their information in CRMs because it's given away their crown jewels. Right. 
And a lot of the data in the CRMs is often incorrect, now out of, out of date. So that's an important source, but not the only source, because maybe you were walking the halls of the agency and you heard a conversation, you had a meeting, that's right. Or you, you heard from somebody or you read something or you did your own research for own question that you had by looking at GA reports, for example. So you have to bring that to the discussion to support the analysis. So this is a software that reflects a very proven successful way of how people would interact to win a competitive pursuit by doing that upfront um, thinking. Okay. A couple of things that you mentioned that I think, again, like you said, there's really a loss of transfer of knowledge, right? Uh, intellectual capital from the previous generation. So uh, we mentioned hot button analysis, key factor analysis. I think that some of those words, people are not familiar with what that means. Oh, well, fair enough. So we always like to say, what's keeping a customer up at night? What are those top four to seven? Not those top 40, because you can't address 40 issues in a competitive pursuit. But what are those top four to seven issues that are driving that procurement? Why? the customer put it out to industry to bid, right? For example, maybe they have an issue with technology obsolescence coming up and their technology is becoming too costly for them to maintain, right? Or um, maybe, for example, they have to consolidate some data centers, right? So what's driving this because there's a government, there's a congressional mandate? Mm. So what is driving the procurement? Now, in that, there'll be issues. Well, we're, we're, we're consolidating these dentist centers. We're concerned about maintaining um, interoperability, right? While supporting uh, um, critical missions. And so what are driving issues? But anybody can identify an issue. The secret sauce, though, is why is it an issue and to whom it's issued? The customer psychographics. What's the priorities of those issues? That's the first thing. Key factors mean what has to be brought to the table by anybody bidding those issues, okay? By anybody who wants to, to address those issues and why are those key factors important? And we look at them from a technical and management personal and corporate experience perspective. And again, we, we always look at the customer psychographics. So issue key factor analysis is a way to understand what are driving your requirements. Now, the key factors are not the solution, but they'll help frame them. And sometimes key factors might be requirements. However, very often the customer will be looking for things that they do not put in the solicitation. So in that example that I said to you before, maybe the customer in the, in the, in the um, like I said, in the uh, requirements, they say we want a, a program manager who's worked in a program of similar size, scope, and complexity. But they never would say, we, we want a program manager who has walked the halls of this building and knows the personalities, politics, and protocols, because we know in particular Bob and Betty are very difficult to work with, and we need <laughs> somebody who could work with them. Right, right, right. They'll never say that. But you know that that's important. Right. And you heard, that, you heard them say it to you in a conversation, right. not to be repeated to anybody else. So when you put your PM forward, you know... Bob and Be Betty are going to find them acceptable, right? However, sometimes you can influence the customer by saying, hey, um, did you ever think about doing this because, for example, if you're doing a, did you ever think about using model-based systems engineering to improve your program governance so that when you're doing change requests, you can do more effective impact analyses? And that's not in the requirements. Right. But all of a sudden, when a solicitation comes out, there it is. And everybody's scratching their head. Where'd that come from? Because you influenced the customer, right? And so um, that's what I mean by issue key factor analysis. So skip that and you, uh, the rest of your um, efforts and your pursuit are done in vain, in my opinion, and, and experience. Right, right. Um, going through. Tell me, uh, you've been working on this now, what, about five years? The software we started uh, a few years ago, a few years okay. ago. Yeah. With the book. When oh, the book. The book, the book um, I published in 2019. And then okay. I published a like a little short, fun, illustrated version. A lot of points I like to make uh, this past year. Okay. But so I always write a ton of articles. I write an article like every week and 
I always post them on the points of view link on our company website and also on the landing page of our software. I, I put them out there as well. I always, okay. always post them on LinkedIn every week. Okay, nice. So we can find you on LinkedIn. Yeah. All right. Peter, L-I-E-R-N-I, -I, Solution Engineering. And on his LinkedIn profile, you can see it follows. And we'll put all this in the show notes. Um, Cap.APMP. So points of view. Tell people that. So again, I mean, I, I had one book. I gave it to Randy because she's the one working on this. But it's I can tell you this. Um, it's really heavy. It's a thick book. <laughs> so tell people what can they expect to get from actually going through the book? Well, um, the premise of the book is that winning proposals are engineered and they're, they're not written. And um, my hat's off to you writing a book because writing a book is a lot of work. And, and a lot of people are smart people, but the smarter people to me are the people take the time to put their thinking down so other people can benefit. So I look forward to your book. I'll definitely get a copy. But um, what the book teaches you is it, it teaches you um, the framework and the kind of considerations, practices, and tools and techniques that um, make the framework come alive. The framework is a way of thinking. And so if it says, well, we, we talk about um, doing competitive assessment, things you should think about. It's not, for example, the what. It's, it's telling you the how. And uh, compliments I've gotten in that book in particular over the years have been, this book is a practitioner's guide. It is a how-to, right? And it's very easy to follow. I, sh I show you it. I say qualified discriminator. I show you how to qualify a discriminator. I show you how to do issue key factor analysis. I show you um, how to, you know, um, what, are the, what are the attributes of a good strength? Of course, there's the FAR and the, the FAR and the DFAR say about the strength, but a strength, the FAR and the DFAR don't tell you as a contractor, make sure that those strengths are visible. Make sure that those strengths trace back to, not only through the requirements, back to the issues, the key factors that are driving those requirements, right? Make, make sure in that strength that you're clearly articulating a quantifiable benefit realization or risk mitigation, right? And you're tying it to a substantiation, a proof point, right? So it just gives you a lot of good tricks and things like that. The course we teach over two days, I, I have taught it during a pandemic. I taught it to a company one time and one long day, almost killed me. I won't do that anymore. So we, I teach it over four or five, about, about five, five hour session, two five hour sessions, two days. And um, I'll do it either uh, on site or remotely, but I think on site is more beneficial. I'm here on your page. And, and for those who are considering follow Peter, uh, I have here on the screen, uh, one of his uh, solutions point of view. And it says the biggest issue in the GovCon proposal creation process so we want to explain this chart that we're looking at. I'm trying to think about uh, today. There's all kinds. Um, yeah, keep scrolling down a little bit because you won't get the full article because you got to subscribe to that. But I can pull up the uh, full article right here. Okay. Hold on. Hold on a second. Let me just pull up that full article. Okay. Sorry, for a moment. Not be able to answer that. My so I'll describe it for the people that are listening in. Um, it's a little while he's pulling this up. It says today's state of play. Uh, today well, yeah, all so it's all an illustration, forgive me. The biggest issue in the GovCon proposal creation process is closing that thinking gap in the middle, okay? So what we're saying here is, is that there are business intelligence tools and CRMs to the left, and there's proposal tools to the right, but there's no tool in the middle that helps you do the thinking. And mm -hmm. that's that's what this article is telling you about, about um, the different types of tools in, in, in the in the marketplace today and um how those tools are essential but they're not sufficient because they're not they there's still something that's missing mm. and we're telling we're telling you that there's a need there's a, a need in the industry for a tool that helps us collaboratively do the thinking and that's what the gist of that article is when you the, if you complete the call to action you can download that article okay gotcha yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just want to go over some things that, like I said, when we we address them. Oh, you, uh, yeah. In fact, if you if you scroll through them, you'll start to see a lot of the topics. Yeah. Are you winning uh, book? Can you scale? Right. Right here. Right. That's, go back. That's true for small um, socioeconomic companies. 
That which, last one. Uh, one. Yes, oh, correct. Yeah, that's why I pulled it oh, up. I want to talk about so this. The, so, so what happens is you get a small business and they're winning. And mostly they're winning because of heroics. Okay? Heroics of a few people. And, and typically, you know, you can't put your A players on all your bids. Right. And guess what about A players? They leave. So how do you make your A, how do you make your B players perform like A players? And how do you make your C players perform like B players? Our software enables that to happen. In fact, we're putting uh, capabilities into it right now that makes it even, even more true. So that's what I'm talking about, scale. And that's particularly true for small businesses. I like it. So for everyone that's uh, listening to this, basically what we're looking at here on the screen is a slide with three graphic images on it. And in the bottom, uh, it's three gentlemen collaborative um, with the thinking light bulb at the top. And then to the right, there's a person on a whiteboard. It says title solution development, writing out some charts and graphs. And then you have a set above it with a graph that shows competitive wins growing up. And you have C, B, and A. And the persons get larger up to increasing the company's value. And then uh, what it describes is on one side, um, the analysis, the X, Y axis, you got deal size going up and then you got talent development deployment going across. So as talent deployment um, increases, so does deal size and competitive wins. And it looks like um, it's a red arrow going up to the top and increase your value of the company. You know, I make a comment on that. So what do companies do? They put their A players on their biggest deals. Right. And and what we're saying is, I'm of the mindset, you should never bid a deal unless you're committed and enabling everybody who is going to be supporting that, committed to winning, and you're enabling everybody who's going to be bidding that uh, to, uh, to, to, um, to support the win. So you got to look at everybody on that, on the team as your own customer or all each other's internal customer. You have to set them up for success. Well, that C player who you're maybe putting at $10 million bid versus the, the A player is on the $150 million bid, that C player, you want to enable that person to win that bid. And that's what we teach. We teach that C player how to, even though that, that small bid, how to start to, how to go against that $10 million bid um, as, an, as an A player. It's not the size of the deal that counts. It's the fact that, that did you win ethically and did you get into the agency so that you can land and expand? Because the cheapest dollars you will ever get, marketing dollars, or with customers you already have once you're in the agency versus trying to break in for the first time. So those those little people or the, on the smaller deals, they're, very, they're just as important in my world. I like that comment you wrote, the cheapest marketing dollars are from existing customers. Yeah. Versus trying to break in. Yeah. Most people don't don't harvest, take the apples off their own tree. They're just, in fact, I make a comment about that. Um, 20 years ago, if you were a PM, you had a PMP certification, you're a PM, and you're a really great PM, that was great. But today, if you're a PM and you cannot do capture, then regrettably, uh, you're a risk to the business because you have to you have to be able to protect that that contract ready for the recompete and you have to be able to land and expand in that customer space you have to be and execute with excellence find to client delivered excellence you have to do that so that's that's what it means to be um a, a person in a pm position in 2023 in my opinion you have to understand how to do capture in that space regardless of company size and a lot of PMs don't like to do that. They like to say, oh, I'm just I'm here to take care of the customer. Right, right. That's great. But guess what? Regrettably, you're a risk to the, the growth of the business. And if the company doesn't grow, people can't get promotions. They can't get raises. They can't, you know, put their kids through college. You can't get cars in the parking lot. Things like that, right? I like that. That's very good. And that's actually a really valid point because we had a situation with a PM that was did a great job in terms of the work, but was did a poor job in terms of communication. And so the customer was not happy with that PM. And so we lost that customer, right? Um, as a result of them 
they were focused on delivery of the actual project, but not on keeping the customer happy in terms of um, just comforting them and 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 saying and responsiveness, uh, timeliness of of sending back emails and little things that they took for granted because it's, well, what's the big deal? We had a meeting. I told him what was going to happen. Now he follows up with another email. Why do I have to send back an email right away? And I said, well, it's, you know, and so that, that happened to me. Well, that's a great story because, um, you know, we all know that project management is 90% communication. So is capture management. Okay. Now what's the most important thing in a human relationship? It's not communication. It's empathy. It's empathy. Okay. So, these our customers are human beings, right? And all human beings are fallen creatures and they have biases and prejudices and access to grind and things like that. And they also appreciate having, um, getting out, you know, being um, out of boys and all that. So being responsive to the customer, that's, it's like in a godfather. This is the business we chose, right? Whether they like it or not. Um, that's the customer. You have to be responsive to them. If they have their little picadillos or things like that, you have to understand them and and if you're you're in this business, you got to be responsive to them because it's the little things they pay attention to. It, it, you might be doing, you know, great, hitting all requirements, but guess what? Um, if they say, well, gee, every time I send this guy an email or gal an email, I don't hear back from them for two days. And right. that's two days of me wondering what or delaying my time because he hasn't responded to me. Right. But yeah, you're still dressing the requirements. But you still cross that guy every every time two days of frustration right right oh, so, yeah, totally no no that's exactly yeah. right. and um you know it's interesting is that it goes back to that issue with um mentoring is so important and back in the day before we had this massive retirement of very experienced people a lot of you know a lot of us were always had the benefit of being mentored by people 15, 20, 25 years are senior. Mm -hmm. And a lot of young people now that are coming in, particularly in, in this hybrid work environment, they don't get that same type of mentoring. Right. So in the past, somebody more senior would pull me aside and say, Peter, you, you know, um, just give me a little bit of guidance for two seconds. Okay. And that's the part of being human, interacting face to face, side by side. And a lot of the uh, young people come into the workforce are not getting that mentoring, that day-to-day, -day, um, you know, look, listen, and learn kind of stuff. No, I, I agree with you. We used to have, what was it called? Beyond mentoring, where you had actual, like, apprenticeships. Apprenticeship, yes. Right. Yeah. We had apprenticeships, and we don't have that anymore. And it's, uh, it's detrimental. And um, I think that... Uh, I'm not a Luddite in terms of technology, but I feel that the technology is actually, um, as much as we think it's helping our performance, it's hurting our performance. The, I think the companies that will excel are the ones who focus on how to be more human, 80% human, 20% technology. <laughs> I, I you know, I have a that. software that I want, I want companies to start to license. I'm a pragmatist. Yeah. Technology is not an excuse for what we've no. been doing for millennia, right? Right, 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 right. Well, they say this is a relationship business. Yes. That's what they say. That's right. So we forget that. And um, But I like the word, like you said, the, the most important thing in relationship is empathy. Empathy. You know, and uh, it's easy to be empath It's easier to be empathetic when you can um, be in the same room and you feel presence and you hear, you hear tone a little bit differently than to be over Teams or Zoom or right. any other type of you know, collaboration, communication mechanism. But we humans, hopefully we'll adapt. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. You know, you're right. Because sometimes people say, well, why do you guys have to fly places to go meet people and shake their hands and look them in the face? But you're right. It's easier to be more empathetic that way. That's right. And, uh, I have, um, I mean, most of us are working remotely, like you and I are communicating today over Zoom, but I have no qualm getting my car and going to drive to see somebody face-to-face, -face. not at all. And getting on a plane and flying to do that, I think is priceless. 
The benefit of our software, though, if I may, is that you don't have to get on a plane or drive from where I live in Loudoun County, Virginia, downtown Washington, D.C., to be in a conference room face to face with people to get the same type of intellectual rigor that you used to get before the pandemic when you're trying to think about how to do a competitive win. Our software enables that much more. But I'm more of a proponent of using our software in a more face-to-face -face collaborative environment. So in the old days, we were face-to-face, -face, or figure out the things I was discussing before. Now I could get the same rigor using the software. However, I, I get the most value out of it is when we're face-to-face -face and we're using the software. We're all in the same room. Right. So, Peter, how can people find out more information? Where would you like us to direct people if they want to learn more about your software, your book, and everything else that you got going on? Well, um, I am this on the, if I can, on the 9th of, uh, no, the 18th of January, I'm going to be um, a vendor in the um, virtual vendor showcase with APMP. So okay. if they go to APMP's virtual vendor showcase, uh, we're going to have a uh, virtual booth there, and we're going to have a, uh, a couple of uh, sessions throughout the day. We'll, our virtual booth will be open all day where people could come and they can um, ask questions and get answers regarding um, the framework, teaching of it, the, our consultancy, and the software. But um, anybody can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm only Peter Learney on LinkedIn. So if you type in L-I-E-R-N-I, -E that's my last name. And first name Peter, that's what you'll find me. Um, if you go to our company website, www.solutioneering, sort of a funky word, I um S O L U T I O N E E R I N G dot company, not dot com. Um, they could get to me that way. And they can access our software there through the hamburger menu, click on the link, which stands for solution engineering tool, or they could go directly to our landing page of our software, um, www.solutionengineeringtool.company. And they could get it that way as well. And I'm um, always welcome to uh, talk with anybody who reaches out. Nice. Thank you. I'm going to make sure, again, like I said, we'll put all the links to everything um, that you mentioned everywhere you find this podcast on our show notes. So we'll make sure to do that, as well as I'll list the uh, link to your book on Amazon. It says here... Uh, let me see. What was it? Two hundred and thirty-six dollars. That's an expensive oh. book. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I have a story about it. Um, uh huh. The founder of my company, after we were after we were bought, would recommend me to go uh, refer me to go teach companies. My way of thinking, and he looked me in the eye and he said, "Peter, if any person ever asks you how much, you tell them." Five thousand house a day because that's what it's worth. So anyway, I had to um, I had to price the book. So our company was acquired for two hundred thirty six dollars and ninety five cents a share. So that's why I priced the book that way. That's the <laughs> price. That's the cost of the book because I remember that number like date seventeen seventy six. Right. However, if somebody ever meets me for lunch. The national capital region, as people know, I give them a copy of the book <laughs> for free, right? There you go. But uh, that when I teach the class, um, I give a copy of the book plus the course manual as well and some other things. So um, in PDU, so when I teach the class, people get a copy of the book plus they get uh, the course manual that's presented um, over the two days and some other things like PDUs. But that's why that's the story of why it's that. I love it. I love it. All right. Yeah. Some some parting words for our audience before we close out today. I would say that um, always remember that uh, we are in a thinking person's business and that winning proposals engineered are not just written. Because when you engineer anything in life, it could be something as simple as a clock, car, whatever the case may be, you have to think. You have to think. And so when we are um, producing proposals and we want to get an outcome, that competitive win, we have to think 
If we skip that step and we just jump to writing, all we did was produce an output that will result in a competitive loss. Wow. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you for the privilege of being on uh, GovCon, Giants. Hey, man. No, thank you, sir. I appreciate you. I'm happy that we've met. Uh, I know that uh, we're continuing the conversation and we look forward to doing some other additional trainings. Um, we've got some other platforms that we use as well. So, but we definitely want to get you on our podcast, which is our most popular platform uh, for connecting entrepreneurs, small businesses to experts and professionals like yourself. So thanks for coming on today. I appreciate your time as always, sir. Uh, like I said, uh, I would encourage everyone to try to meet Peter in person so you can get a copy of that book. <laughs> uh, I will say though, um, I wish I had it here. I had it for a while behind me. And then I took it so uh, Randy, uh, who's in charge of Alchemy, she can have it, a copy. So I'll have to come to Virginia to get my copy. It might be the same cost of a flight to Virginia. $236. I could probably get up there to, we'll, to see. We'll see. All right. We'll see. All right. We'll I'll, mail you, I'll mail you an extra one. All right. I appreciate you, sir. I appreciate you. No, Just so. Email me your mailing address. I'll mail you another one. Okay. I can do that. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. So, all right, Peter, well, listen, thank you so much for coming on today and uh, look forward to hearing about you on the GovCon Giants podcast. Thank you, everyone.